What's the word, y'all? Every single playoff series has played at least one game, and I'm here to talk all things playoffs, ladies and gentlemen. My original schedule was to drop a playoff prediction video the day before the actual playoffs, but things came up, um, so I couldn't record that video. But now I can, so I do still have my original, uh, my original predictions. None of that have really changed, but I will be talking about some of the things I saw in the game ones around here. Uh, but I will be honest with you, some of these games I got close to like no eye time with in the live setting. I did watch some condensed versions watch some highlights and stuff but uh this weekend was a very eventful one for me became a father st still very weird to say aloud so obviously you know we're in a hospital for 82 hours or whatever it was and you got this tiny human you got to care for basketball was one of the last things on my priority list but i did get a get around to watching at least a little bit like i said my overall predictions for series were not swayed based on the one singular game but i just want to i just want to talk some hoops with y'all baby get back in the swing of things all right so i'm actually going to start off with today's games because those are the ones that's on my mind like like Chris Paul just took over fourth quarter, and I'm super excited about that. Um, Suns and five is my prediction for that. It's not a lot to really say about this series other than the Suns are just a more complete, better basketball team. And you saw a lot of that in the first half of this where Pelicans put up 32 points in the first half. The defense was locked in. Um, in the third quarter, the Pels made that run, though. It turned into, like, from a 20-point game to a single-digit game. You got some CJ, you got some Brandon Ingram. And then Chris Paul was like, oh, I'm going to do my thing and take over this game. I love the players. We talked about them extensively after their playing games. I love a lot of the players on the Pelicans, but I don't believe that they have enough firepower to make this a super interesting series. But I do give them one game mostly because they do have a bunch of bucket getters. I can see Brandon Ingram having a 35-piece and then CJ McCollum also having 30. And then Jonas Valanciunas also has a really big game, and boom, they just the game but overall the likelihood of this series going any other direction other than the suns is like two percent it feels like i'll just get the bulls one out of the way um people are like oh this got the feel of a good old-fashioned 90s no it didn't oh just because the score is low don't mean it feel like the 90s in the 90s they still hit shots no nobody could do anything today other than Giannis. Gian Giannis looked like a guy that was an nba player going into the ymca and now if you look at the stat line he finished with only 27 but i promise you it was the most dominant 27 we've seen in a very long time ah, i wanted this one so very bad you know what i'm saying i got my c red shirt on i put my daughter in a shirt that say watching the bulls with daddy or something like that it was fire i'm like oh first playoff game in half a decade let's go chicago even though i believe that majority of the people on panels are like Bucks and four, Bucks and four, Bucks and four, which I completely understand. The Bulls haven't beat the Bucks in the last 13 times when um, Giannis is playing, which is a crazy statistic in itself. And then on the broadcast, they said something like, the Bulls are 1-18 in the last 19 games against the Bucks." I'm like, bro, we get it. You feel me? We get, People understand. The Bulls can't beat the Bucks. We get it. You don't have to keep rubbing it in. Um, so my initial prediction was like, can I, can I get the Bulls to win one game? This was the game, y'all. This was the game they should have won. The Bucs struggle in game ones. It's just a fact. They even talk about it on the broadcast. The only reason they won last year's game one is because Chris Middleton hit a buzz beater. They struggle in game ones. And both of these teams, a lot of the teams you saw is like some somewhat bad basketball because a lot of these teams haven't played in a week because we had to wait for the play-in, then wait for travel. We got to do all of this stuff. And you could tell the Bulls' big three got off 24%, 33%. 32%. That's bad. But if you look on the other side, the Bucks, um, big two or the other two other than Giannis, 30%, 37%. This was the game. If there was going to be a game for the Bulls to win, this was the one. I don't see a scenario where Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday also uh, continue to shoot 30% from the field. But you can also see on the flip side, you don't see a scenario where DeMar DeRozan shoots 24%. Or you see a, a, a situation where the starting center is shooting 33% for the Bulls. I can see that happening again. I can because I've seen it happen a couple times this season or something similar. And exactly in this first playoff game, there was a lot of nerves for this Bulls team. Um, and they they have this reputation against good teams. Obviously, everybody knows statistics because StatMuse tweets it every damn day when the Bulls lose a game. Uh, they struggle against good teams, like really, really struggle. Historically bad against good teams. And in those games, they always struggle out the gate. And they did that. I think it started off 9-0 run. I'm tweeting live tweeting games again. It's so much fun because I believe that majority of people understand when I'm joking and when I'm not. And I say majority of people, but because it, it, it can't be everybody. This just felt like a one that they could they could win, but they started off very, very slow. The nerves are probably an all-time high. You got to think about it. Some of these players have never played playoff basketball at all. And Zach Levine just broke a record of, or I guess not the record. He was the longest active NBA player to not appear in the playoffs. It's over. I hope that next game we get more Ayo Desumu because he played a big part in this season. And I know for the second half of the season, he wasn't as good as the first half. Regardless, he provides some some defense. And I think that the defense for, for the Bulls was pretty solid today. Again, a lot of people were just missing shots too. But I thought the defense was better than what I think a lot of people expected it to, to be. I would love Patrick Williams to not 
pass up wide open three pointers anymore. Just let it fly, homie. Nobody else on the team was sending shots, so I'm not mad at you if you shot one more extra one. We shot 19% from three, 19%, 32% from the field as a team. Um, but my initial thing was Bucks at five. But since the Bulls didn't win this one, where it felt like the Bucks were bad. I don't know, bro. I'm going to keep my original thing, but I would not be surprised if it was a, a, a real-life Bucks info. All right, probably the best, not probably, the best game of the day was Bucks, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Boston versus the Brooklyn Nets. Wow, wow, wow. I think I've mentioned this a few times on the channel and on the podcast. This has been my most anticipated series because we got two teams that I honestly believe have enough talent to make the big run, and we're getting it in the first round, a 2-7 nonetheless, in the first round. And like I said, I, I'm somewhat of a, a, um, a Nets skeptic. I do believe they have the talent to do it, but would they be able to do it? I always a bit iffy about that. In this game, they ended up losing on dramatic fashion. What a possession for the Boston Celtics. Shout out to Emay for not calling timeout. I love when when coaches understand that their players run off these things and like they had been running with the Brooklyn Nets all day long. He's like, let them run his break. Let them run his break. And listen, Draymond Green made this tweet during the game or after the game. And me and the homies literally said the exact same thing as we watching. Hold on. Let me find this tweet. So his tweet says, and there's the difference in the Celtics team. Last year, Marcus Smart would have taken that shot. Eme got him to buy in and be the Marcus Smart everyone loved out of Oklahoma State. Beautiful. Looking like a true point guard again. That's what made him special. And me and the homies, of course, we'd be live watching a lot of these games. We all said something along the lines of, I cannot believe Marcus Smart did not take that shot. Not just because it's Marcus Smart, but considering the city, you know how much awareness you have to have to see two people sprinting at you. When you know, you obviously know that the time is going down. To see two people sprinting at you and to make the extra pass knowing damn well you might have 1.2 seconds to get that pass off and get it up. And, it, again, it is Marcus Smart, too. I mean, he was having a very good game. For him not to let it fly is just beautiful basketball. Tatum said afterwards, hey, that was that was just a layup for me. I ain't really have to do much. Um, This was a dog fight. This was a great game, and I cannot wait to get six more of these because my prediction has been Boston and seven. And I know a lot of people pick Brooklyn, and I'm not mad at you. Brooklyn had the talent. We saw today Kyrie Irving basically be a perfect basketball player on the offensive side of the ball. Defense is always going to be iffy with Kyrie, but I can't even be mad at him if you're giving your team about 40 points or 60% shooting. I can't be mad if he takes the possessions off, but I will be mad if you take the possessions off if it is the last two possessions of the game because Jalen Brown got a very easy bucket late in this one. In that last possession, I know they were throwing doubles at everybody, doubles to everybody because they're trying to either get the ball out of the hands, make them force a turnover, make them think that the time is running out enough that they got to jack up a shot. But the defense for the Brooklyn Nets down the stretch was not as good as you want it to be, obviously. Bruce Brown did a lot of yapping in these interviews before this series started. Didn't do a damn thing. He actually, in his 36 minutes, he felt somewhat of a liability, which is crazy because for the last three months, he has been very, very good for them. And P and, and I and listen, I had I saw some people who had a nerve. Oh my God, I'm not. I would never say something like I. I felt like I sounded like Stephen A. Smith, and I would never want to do that. Um, people have the nerve to say, Ah, I don't know if Ben should come back. Hello. I love Bruce Brown, bro. I like I've been on the Bruce Brown bandwagon since Detroit. I understand how good he can be. But in a game like this, this is this is where you need Ben Simmons. The defense was skeptic skeptic. The defense was bad. The defense was bad. And the rebounding was worse. Brucey, love him. He's a, a, a plus rebounder, a 6'4 guard, power forward center. But Ben would help on that glass. And they let Al Horford do his thing on that glass. Daniel Tice was not bad on the glass. I cannot believe there are people that are really believing that Ben Simmons would not be an upgrade over the four minutes you got a, of Kessler Evers. No disrespect to the Rook. But like taking a couple minutes away from Brucey, taking some minutes away from Drummond, or even Clax, who had a good game, but he just can't hit free throws. It's, it's crazy for people to think that that, that won't be the case. And I also would love to see some LaMarcus Aldridge minutes in game two. I'm not saying he got to play 40, but I would love to see what E may decide to do if LaMarcus in the game. He's slower. Um, he's worse on defense than a lot of the players on the team. But his little mid-range jump shots, offensive firepower could help a little bit. Open the game up a little bit more for Kyrie. Um, if there is any silver lining for the Brooklyn Nets, they lost in the buzzer beater in, in the game where Kevin Durant might have had his worst playoff basketball game of all time one of his worst games of all time so there is some bright spots like hey we were in this game where we really only had Kyrie Irving going against the entire uh city of Boston literally the whole city of Boston I'm still rocking my initial pick which was Boston in seven
Uh, did I tell you that I'm just a dude with a microphone, so you might disagree with everything I say, but that's completely okay. Cool. The last game for today was this Heat versus Hawks game where I probably got five minutes of watch time on. And it was mostly because we were getting discharged from the hospital. You don't care about that type of stuff. So I didn't get to watch this game. But when I saw this box score and saw that Trey Young was one for 12 with six turnovers and that Bogey, Bojan, no Bogey, Bo, Bo, Bogdan Bogdanovich was 0 for 8. I almost lost my mind. You cannot tell me these two dudes shot one of 20 from the field. You can't tell. You could not have convinced me that was even possible. And I know that he defense is one of the best in the league, and I commend them for that. But I would even I didn't even think it was going to be eight points for Trey Young is wild. Him scoring under 10 points in a playoff game is wild. And I, I did watch the first two minutes of it maybe and him and jimmy butler got into each other's face and people on twitter was like oh i, I love villain trey young and low-key i do too but, but the villain got packed up today if he if he a villain the movie ended with him getting arrested it's over with you know what i'm saying he's in gotham asylum right now he I, kevin knox give kevin my kevin knox real minutes shout out to the miami heat man debo going out there and hitting eight threes is crazy i doubt debo is going to do that again uh he is a very good player obviously one of the greater shooters in the league even though this was somewhat of a down year for him um i don't expect him to hit eight more next game but who really knows maybe debo just fell in that spot um i don't expect trey young to and, and bogey to shoot one for 20 and i think that the travel thing was big for them too i think they got into miami at 3 30 a.m the day before and a lot of stuff and i I don't know. I still, my initial pick was Miami in six because I still do believe that Atlanta has enough to maybe still a game or two, but not having a Clint Capella is, is real rough, but I still believe they can win a game or two, but regardless, Miami's probably going to win that series. All right, let's get to yesterday's slate of games. Ooh, yesterday's slate of games was kind of solid, bro. And I'm going in the reverse order too. The Warriors uh, win 123 to 107. And th you know who we got to talk about. You know, the Splash Nephew. Uh, the boy that took Steph Curry's starting spot in this play. Steph Curry had to come off the bench in like a decade. And they were cool with him not even having a good game because Jordan Poole is, is that guy. And Klay Thompson hitting some of his first shots of the game after missing um, playoff basketball since 2019. Bro, it's so wild. There's so many stories here. Um, and I, my initial, my initial um, thing here says uh, Warriors in six. I did believe that Jokic can wheel them to a couple victories. And even Draymond Green said after the game that he wouldn't put past that Jokic might have a 40-point triple-double next game because he's angry at the, the performance from his team. But I like the way Steve Kerr and Draymond Green decided to do this thing, bro. I love the way they did. Because, listen, there's not a lot of people in the league that can stop a guy like Jokic, right? Draymond can slow bro down, and he did. They, was, they packed up this paint. And they realized that the supporting Cavs was Monte Morris. Will Barton had a really good game for his tennis. His defense was good. He hit his shots. But uh, Monte Morris, Will Barton, Aaron Gordon, and Jeff Green, oh, okay, we're going to let y'all try to beat us. And if y'all do, perfect. That's okay. But the likelihood of that happening is very low. So we're going to pack this paint. Jokic has not hit a three-pointer in like a month, it feels like. He, I mean, he's a good three-point shooter, but in the last month, I think he's shooting 15% from three. He can't hit those. So they packed the paint. And was like, Jokic, if you're going to beat us, you got to get super physical. And Draymond Green is all about his physicality. And they had a good defensive game plan. And then they had Jordan Poole turning into the player that he is. They actually had the top three candidates for most improved player come out today. So surprised that Jordan Poole didn't make top three. I understand. Even my own personal ballot had like seven different players on it. So I understand why, you know, some people can't make the cut. But performances like this is why I, I'm just like enamored by the amount of effort and work that goes uh, that went into Jordan Poole, whether it be him by himself or the Warriors organization as a whole, he has blossomed, bro. He was in the G. He was in the G last year. Think about that. He was in the G League last year, and he's starting in the playoff game and dropping 30, confident 32, memeing the whole way. You know what I'm saying? He's going to be a lot of people's favorite player based off that alone. Whenever the camera's on him, he got a face. He's making a face. You know what I'm saying? And, and you... You got to love that. So I'm still going with the Warriors grand scheme. Oh, man. Let's talk about this 4-5 matchup out east. And this is 76ers versus Raptors. Um, This one right here was a tough one to make a prediction about. Mostly because I thought that the um, that the Toronto Raptors matched up very well 
against the 76ers. You know what I'm saying? Everybody on their team is like 6'8", massive wingspans. They get in the passing lanes. I think Gary Trent and Fred Van Vliet both were top five in deflections. They got Scotty B. They got Pascal. And they got, even though they don't have a single person that can stop Joel and B, they have so many different looks that they could throw at them. But even with that being said, they still, the, the 76 still have Joel and B. And though James Harden might not have the step that he had two years ago, three years ago, he still can play at a high level, and he did that. So I saw a lot of people making the – I don't even want to call it a hipster pick because it's more than that because the Raptors are actually a really good team. There's a reason. It's a 4-5 matchup, so it's not a hipster pick if you thought or you think that the Raptors will win this series. But I still went with the team that I thought had the better top-end talent. Um, and that would be the 76, but I did go all the way to seven with it. I don't know if it will be seven because now Gary Trent is questionable or doubtful. Um, Scotty Barnes tweaked that ankle and oh my God, that I hated to see that bro. Cause I, I did believe this was going to be a series that's going to be pretty solid, but it didn't uh, end up being, I actually, let me look at my notes. Cause I actually watched this game in its entirety. One of the big things, this is, this is in my notes. Look at me, K Kenny. Um, and this is not anything new. If you listen to any podcast, it probably says something similar. In order for the Raptors to win this series, they have to destroy the 76ers when Joel Embiid is on the bench. And they didn't do that. Actually, um, when Joel Embiid was on the bench, the Raptors lost the game by four total points. And that cannot be the case. Any team that's going to beat the 76ers in a series has to win the Joel Embiid list minutes because that's when they're at the most dominant. Obviously, he's an MVP caliber player. That's when they're at the most dominant. And they don't have the extreme amount of depth of some of the other teams that they will be facing. So when Joel Embiid hits that bench, we got to play our best basketball because that is the only way. I believe that the series against I, I believe the series against Toronto, where Kawhi Leonard hit the shot, Joel Embiid had he was positive in his minutes. Whenever Joel Embiid was on the floor, they were good. They won the matchups. It was the minutes when he wasn't on the floor, and I think that might be the case in the Atlanta series too. Regardless. The way you beat the 76ers is dogging them when Joel B was not on the court, and they didn't do that in game number one. We got to give a lot of love to Tyrese Maxey, bro. You got, um, and we're going to talk about this game next. We got Anthony Edwards, Jordan Poole, Tyrese Maxey. It's just so many young players just like, and I don't know how many of these dudes are going to blossom into superstars. It's kind of irrelevant. But so many people that are just so very, very talented at the game of basketball. And I'm missing some names, too. I'm sure there are some people that were tonight that's not on the back of my mind that are young that killed it today. Like, um, you know what? I'm not even going to I'm not even going to waste the brain power. It's just you know that there's talent in this league. Tyrese Maxey was electric in this one, bro. No matter what it was. And the, the one of the main reasons why I had him as one of my <laughs> top seven most approved player candidates is that he turned into one of the best three-point shooters in the entire NBA out of nowhere. If you look at his pre-draft report, it was like, oh, he's cool, but can he hit threes? Um, And it only took him a season to figure it out. Yeah, he can. Whether it be catch or shoot, on the move, didn't matter. And I just like that anytime the ball is rebounded by his team, he is shot out of a cannon. He is down the court. He is running. He is running. And that type of energy is electric. And, and I think that when people were predicting the series, and again, it's, we only saw game number one, so anything can happen. Um, I believe that people were over over complicating the Matisse Thybul thing. Matisse Thybul obviously is a great defender, and he can help your team out when he's on the floor. But he played he play 18 minutes and he ain't really do much today or in, in yesterday so him not being able to travel to toronto for those two games might hurt but it it might not it legit might not we talk about the playoffs here where the best of the best are probably going to get 40 minutes especially if it's a close game they might get 44 45 minutes depending on which game it is so um could it hurt hell yeah but it didn't hurt in game number one we even got some b-ball paul minutes i'd love to see that even though in those 10 minutes he had 11 he had uh he had four fouls uh, I still gonna pick stick with my original pick, which is 76ers and seven. And uh, man, I just it's unfortunate that we get to this point, and in game one, Thaddeus Young gets injured. Um, like I said, Gary Trent and Scotty Barnes all get injured. It's it's super super unfortunate because we won't get the full experience of what this series could have been. You know what I'm saying? Because of that, but I hope that maybe these are one game injuries. If that, only time will tell. Timberwolves with the upset. Oh boy. Did the higher seed win every single game other than this one this week? The higher seed won every single game. NBA playoffs is mid. We get one upset out of eight games? That's crazy, bro. Okay, so Minnesota Timberwolves came out to play in the grind house. They was the one doing the grinding balls. Um, they looked very, very good. Another, I don't, I don't, again, I don't like giving excuses for teams that lose, but like the Memphis Grizzlies are similar to some of the other teams when I say that they haven't played basketball. And uh, 10 days, like a, like a week's time plus a little bit, you feel me? Um, you could definitely see that. You, my original thing in my notes said uh, Grizzlies in six, and I'm going to stick by that even though they lost game one. This is a, a perfect storm for a guy like Anthony Edwards 
who has been incredible in his first playoff game, and I'm counting the the play in as a post in his first postseason. He has looked incredible, which is great. Carl Anthony Towns with a big comeback after, of course, we know the type of stinker that he put up in the playing game. He showed the world, listen, that ain't the real version of me. This is really me. And having a guy like Malik Beasley come off the bench and hit his shots, and having Jaden McDaniels hit his shots just increases the the amount of uh, value to a guy like Anthony Edwards, who could just legitimately take over games. You feel me? Who who what, was it? Patrick Beverly? Somebody in this team told Anthony Edwards that his ceiling somebody said that his ceiling is Michael Jordan and because of that everybody got all these photoshops of Anthony Edwards as Michael Jordan and you know what I don't hate it why why can't he be Jordan with with a little bit I can't even say with a little bit more swag because though Jordan wasn't like a flashy talkative dude in the media there's a lot of swag behind Michael Jordan bro I'm, I'm keeping a buck um, the, the Grizzlies had a guy Stephen Adams who had been a very impactful player for them this season basically be non-existent he was non-existent in this, in this matchup. And actually, the only reason he played 24 minutes is because Jared Jackson Jr. was in foul trouble. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, Coach Taylor Jenkins found out very early, oh, this might not be a good matchup for Steven Adams. So let's let's yank him and let Jaren run the full five. And then he got into some foul trouble. He ended up with seven blocks, which was cool. He got yammed on a couple times. But I don't believe that the, the performance that we got from Desmond, the performance we got from DeAnthony, the performance we got from Jaren as far as shooting the ball is going to happen more than maybe one more time in a series. But I got to show a lot of love to Minnesota, bro. I didn't even realize I followed so many Minnesota Timberwolves fans on my time on my Twitter. It's either I follow a lot or the ones that I do follow is just retweeting everything because I saw nothing but Minnesota Timberwolves memes and gifts on the timeline. And I didn't hate it. I got a lot of love for the city. Never been there before, but when you think about a, a franchise that's been through turmoil, that's been through six flips, firing the GM right before the season started, trading away players for less than the value that they probably worth, and for them to be in the spot in the playoffs and winning a game where they were the underdog is a dub. But you know what? It's not completely crazy. Because legit, I did see some people, and I'm talking about the higher regards, ES, some ESPN writers or whether it's Bleach Report, pick the Minnesota Timberwolves to win this series, which would be super intriguing and which will be a failed season for the Grizz. You understand why. I ain't got to tell you why first round elimination for the number two seed would be a failed season, right? Cool. Even though you did have progression of jaw like that. But like you were a playoff team last year, and if you lose in the first round, you ain't really. Anyway, um, I think those are all my predictions. I think those are all my predictions. I'm excited to like actually be able to sit down and watch tomorrow's slate of games like front to back. Sleep schedule is so wild. I know it's been two days since baby Aves was born, but like sleep, sleep schedule is so crazy that maybe I'm not watching these games front to back because I might be in this chair dozing off, bro. That's, that's how I be. Um, but I appreciate all the support. Let me know in the comment section. Uh, was your initial prediction on the series changed after watching game number one? Let me know. I'll see y'all soon. All right, y'all, so it's the next day, and I realized that I did not talk about Dallas versus Utah, which is funny because if you ask some Utah fans or you ask some Mavericks fans, uh, they're going to say, Kenny don't like talking about us. And the fact that I completely forgot to talk about their series and trying to deep dive into the playoffs is ironic because I don't have any ill will against any organization. Uh, game number one wasn't very fun. It was another one of those games where nobody could hit a shot, and not having Luka just completely ruined the fun for me. Um, originally, I was like, man, okay, let's say Luka loses one game. He doesn't play one game. I still feel confident saying Dallas in six. And I feel like a lot of people have turned an eye on Utah because they just – I think a lot of people are just ready for them to make those changes, whether it is Rudy, whether it is Donovan or Mike Conley. We've seen this this version of the Utah Jazz for like four years now. I think a lot of people just wanted to end in the first round so we can have a shakeup in the league. That's not the way I'm thinking when I'm predicting the series, though. I would love to see a little shakeup. And even if they keep in Donovan or Rudy Gobert, I would love to see them have shape up, you know, uh, whether it be the rest of the starters, the bench, regardless. But when Luka went down with that injury, I was thinking to myself, okay, Okay, it's a calf strain, and those can take like three weeks. And that's coming from some of the doctors I follow on Twitter, the, the sports doctors I follow on Twitter, three weeks. So that means that he might be back for game two. So when I made my prediction of Dallas in six, it was mostly because I thought that Luka might be back for game two. And well, they said that he's questionable slash doubtful, and that completely changes some things. Can I see a world where, you know, the Mavericks have Luka come back in game three and they use the last six games to win four? Sure. But the Utah Jazz are still a very good basketball team. You know, this is not a series that's like a 1-8 matchup where, where even being down in two games is not that much of a deal. It actually is a deal because the Utah Jazz, as much as, as, as weird they are, they're still a solid team. They're still a good team. They got Donovan Mitchell, a playoff performer. Game one, Bogdanovich came out to play. I will say, though, I did watch condensed version of this game. 
and um, uh, Rudy Gobert has to be better offensively. Uh, something that we've said for a half of a decade at this point. The defense for Rudy was great this one. I, I can say that with confidence. Of course, I'm not expecting him to stay in front of Spencer Dinwiddie full-time or even Jalen Brunson full-time. But as far as being the, the epicenter of this defense and, and holding it down low, he did that. And they actually destroyed the rebound battle in this one, which is a big part of this win. They still need him to be better on offense because I saw trending on Twitter a clip where he had Jalen Brunson on his back and nobody gave him the ball. And that's part. I'm, it's partially his fault because they don't trust him with that ball when he has a 5'11 dude on him. He's got to be better. Anyway, I haven't changed my prediction for any series going into this, so I'm going to keep my initial prediction, but it don't feel good after game one and knowing that Luka probably won't play game two and even is still questionable for game three. It's just the worst possible timing. Uh, it's just unfortunate timing for one of the best in the league, all-NBA first-team player Luka Doncic to go down uh, and maybe another first-round exit, which would be bad.